Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We are coming to you from uh, the pastor's study slash church office, a uh, little bit of everything else room here in our church, and uh, where it's time for Bible study. I'm glad you joined us. I hope you're prepared and ready. I hope you got your Bible. Uh, can't study the Bible without the Bible. I mean, that's, uh, that just goes without saying. And I hope you got you maybe a pen and a notebook so you can jot down uh, uh, things. And uh, I found that uh, uh, I remember better things. If I, I remember things better if I write them down. I uh, heard a fellow say one time a long time ago, a short pencil is better than a long memory. And I do not have a long memory, so I like to write things down. But thank you for joining us uh, here on this Wednesday night. And maybe before too long, we will be able to go back and... and uh, be able to return. I think maybe in a couple of weeks things are looking good. Uh, the next couple of Sundays we will be having drive-in church. You'll be able to drive in and uh, be in the parking lot. Uh, you can bring uh, outdoor chairs or and uh, and we'll still be doing it on Facebook. So you can you can sit in your car and watch it on Facebook on your iPhone. Uh, so you know there's uh, we've got a lot of ways for you to get the uh, to get the service. But uh, we're looking forward to that, and we'll do that a couple of weeks, and if things continue to look good, uh, maybe by the first Sunday in July, we will be able to uh, start in-person services again with limitations, and uh, we will make those available to everybody <coughs> when you come to church on that Sunday morning. But uh, anyway, thanks for being here today. Uh, we're continuing to study tonight uh, in uh, looking at uh, Jesus' teaching, events and teachings uh, in the upper room. Uh, the upper room was, uh, was an unusual and fantastic uh, time for the disciples, uh, intimate time. They spent time with Jesus, and he did some, uh, uh, some very important teaching. Now, all teaching that Jesus did was important. But uh, this uh, teaching that he was doing now was in light of the fact that in a few hours uh, he would be facing uh, the unfair trials, the betrayal and arrest, uh, the denial of, of Peter, and uh, all the things that he would have to go through leading up to his crucifixion, his death, and his burial and his resurrection. This is, uh, like I say, this is, only four or five days from uh, the glorious resurrection. And uh, one of the things that he'd been talking about with the disciples and taught the disciples about was uh, what we're going to look tonight. We're going to be in John chapter 14. So if you get your Bible and turn there, and uh, we'll be looking at verse 12 through 14. Only three verses tonight, but three very powerful verses. Uh, remember now, everything is, is kind of like uh, in the context of everything Jesus is talking about, he is, he is in the upper room with the disciples, and uh, he has been telling them all along through his three-year ministry with them that you know, there's going to come a day, uh, these things are going to happen. Uh, the man, son of man, he said the son of man is going to be betrayed unto men. Uh, he said they're going to uh, uh, abuse him, they're going to uh, beat him. Uh, uh, then finally they will uh, kill him, and uh, then he also uh, uh, previewed with them uh, his glorious resurrection. So he's been telling them this uh, all along, but now it becomes in earnest when he begins to tell them, you know, it's it's time. Uh, this These events that I've talked about that are going to happen to me uh, to fulfill uh, my father's plan for me so he could go to the cross and die for man's sin, shed his blood, and that's the satisfying payment for man's sin. Uh, all those things are getting ready to transpire. And that's why I believe he said in chapter uh, 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, I believe they were troubled by these things. And who wouldn't be if you were one of Jesus' disciples and you had traveled with him for three years and then all of a sudden, uh, on this very special uh, holiday, if you will, uh, uh, the Passover, and then he institutes the Lord's Supper, 
they find out that, oh man, all the news is not good news. Um, and uh, so uh, he begins to talk with them about uh, things that are going to happen hereafter, after uh, he departs from them. And one of the things he's going to deal with tonight is he's going to talk to them about the fact that the work that he's been doing, the work that he has been doing for the Father is going to continue. Because they may be looking and say, well, Jesus is going away. Hey, shop's going to close up. Uh, you know, the store's going to close. We're not going to have a job. Uh, you, know, we, you know, it's all about him and all around him. But Jesus uh, teaches them tonight in these, uh, begins to teach them tonight in these uh, verses in verse 12, 13, and 14 that no, uh, you know, I'm going away. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, the work will continue. And they must have thought, well, who in the world is going to do the work? Well, it's going to be you. Uh, I'm going to work through you. And we're going to talk about what kind of people does Jesus use to do his work. And uh, we'll, look, we'll, we'll look at that in that venue. And uh, so let's, let's read our scripture tonight in John chapter 14 and beginning in verse 12. And I believe I'm reading from the infallible in our word of God. That infallible mm -hmm. means it never fails. Jesus said the word of God should never fail. And when we say inerrant, that means there's no mistakes. Uh, God didn't make any errors in his word. Mm -hmm. So in verse 12, uh, he starts it out by using a word that is very familiar by now to them, verily, verily. Uh, when, he, when he says verily, he's saying this is something that is, that is definite, that is sure that is really, really truthful, really going to happen. So he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Remember I said that they're thinking about, well, Jesus is going away. He's just, he's been telling us that. He's going to be betrayed, arrested, and denied, and all this stuff. Uh, you know, the work, evidently this church Jesus thing, or whatever is, you know, gospel thing is, is over. No, uh, it's going to continue because he says, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And so let's read on. He says, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now we're going to look at these three verses here. And like I say, <coughs> our subject basically, basically tonight is looking at, first of all, we're going to talk about Jesus is outlining the fact, like I say, he's, he's saying the work's going to go on. I, I'm going away, there's no doubt. And uh, you might, uh, it's kind of like I, I thought about Dr. Billy Graham or some of these other great pastors or men of God, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on Sunday morning, uh, you can watch several different uh, uh, televised uh, services and televised preaching services. One of them is you can watch Dr. Graham on, on Face or not on Facebook, yeah, on Facebook or on the internet. Uh, you can watch uh, D. James Kennedy out of Florida. Uh, you can watch Adrian Rogers. Uh, he used, uh, used to be the pastor there in Memphis, a great uh, church there, Barrel Few Baptist Church, and great preaching and, and listen and get inspired. Uh, and maybe sometimes people watch and don't realize those men have passed on. Uh, but their, their ministry and their preaching is still going on. And uh, I, thought, I thought about this when I thought about Jesus saying, well, you know what, I'm, I, he's, he's giving all this information that I'm going on, I'm going to be uh, arrested and, and tried and convicted and, and put to death by me. And well, well, how in the world is the work going to go? Well, it's going to go on through you. And uh, that's what he's talking about. So we're going to, first of all, we're going to look at this maybe a couple of different ways, we look at every verse. And uh, because he says, what kind of people, I want you to know what kind of people uh, Jesus uses to do his work. He really gives us four different aspects 
of those that he can use to serve him. So he, uh, uh, he says, first of all, in verse 12, he says, people who believe in me are the ones that I can use to do the work that my father, continue the work that my father has sent me to do. And then he'll go on and say, well, and we're going to go back and look at these, people who are uh, actively involved in the work are people that I can use. In other words, people that want to work, that have a work ethic about doing the work of the ministry. And then number three, he says, people who are praying people. Uh, you can't do the work of the Lord without being a prayer warrior. It takes prayer. God has made it that way. And uh, he wants us to pray uh, and ask him for the things that we need to do the work. And then number four, people who want to glorify God through the work that Jesus did. And that's the last thing he says. And that's, that's basically the reason for everything. Um, and uh, so we'll look at it in that perspective. <coughs> but we also want to look at it in another way. Uh, I, I, there was four other things that, that kind of go along with that. And like I say, you know, I like to write things down as God shares them with me. Well, number one, Jesus is saying in these verses, everyone who believes uh, will continue to do my work and active, actively being, will be involved in the work of the Lord. In other words, faith is, if we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe who he is and what he came for and why he's having to die. It, our faith is going to motivate us to work. You know, uh, uh, James talked about that uh, and when he wrote his little epistle. He said, you know, there's some out there that said, well, I can prove my relationship with God through my faith. Obviously, faith is where it all begins. But he also said, I, he said, he said, a person has got to have works too. Now, works don't save you. Once you get this understood, faith comes first, but out of that faith comes works. And what he said was, the works validate the statement of faith. It's hard for me to believe sometimes when I hear somebody's profession of faith or their testimony that they're saved, maybe been saved 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever, and yet they've never done anything in the way of a work to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what James is saying. He said, he said faith without works is what? It's dead. It has a dead testimony. So when Jesus is talking about it here, he says, everyone who believes will continue to do my work. There is, there is the idea if if we've got faith in our hearts to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we're already going to be active in serving the Lord. We're going to have a motivation. I like what that old fellow, one of those, you know, Jesus cast demons out of a lot of different people, and he cast demons out of the maniac of Gadara, many demons, and there was one, uh, uh, it may have been him, that said, uh, he said, I want to go with you. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to live for you. I want to do the work. Jesus told him, to go home and tell your family what great things the Lord have done unto you. He wasn't telling him nothing. Why did he tell him that? That's the work. Telling people of what Jesus done for us and telling people that God is there and is real. Uh, so that's the work. But the idea is here, that man had a built-in motivation. Jesus didn't have to sit him down and teach a 12, uh, you know, a 12 part course on why you ought to want to serve God. People ought to want to serve God because if they believe God, they trust God, know God, know the Lord, been saved, there is going to be an ingrained desire to be actively working for the Lord. And that's why he says here, everyone who believes me will continue to do my work. Now we're going to go back and look at these verses and kind of amplify them, but I just want to get you the gist here of what we're looking at. Number two, Greater works will be done than the works that I have done up to this point by those who believe in me and are actively involved in the work of the Lord. So you see how this 
it, it kind of goes from one to the other. He says, first of all, if someone believes in me, they're going to have an inbuilt, ingrained uh, motivation and desire to do the work, uh, to make people aware of who Jesus is, to make people aware of who the Father is. They're going to be active. And then if they're active believers, they are going to have opportunity to do even greater works than I've done. Now this is one of those verses that, <coughs> to be honest, is uh, misinterpreted and uh, misquoted sometimes and mispreached sometimes. And we're going to talk about what are those greater works. Jesus did some pretty fantastic things. He healed the sick, raised the dead. And I've heard people, I've heard people and preachers use this and say, well, Jesus said we're going to do, you know, if Jesus uh, walked on the water, we ought to be able to fly around the mountaintop. If Jesus did this, we doing greater works, we ought to do this. Uh, I don't believe Jesus is talking here about the nature of the works being greater. I believe he's talking about the magnitude of the works being greater. You know, you can, uh, uh, there, there's a sign on your computer, or on, I guess in other typewriters too. It's been so long since I've seen a typewriter, but uh, there's, a, there's a chevron or a kind of a, like an error missing the shaft that goes one way, and that's lesser than. And then there's one that goes to the right, and, uh, or my right anyway, and probably your left, uh, that means greater than. And, uh, and uh, so if you put that uh, little mark, looks like an arrowhead almost, and it points this way on your paper, uh, anything you put before it, it means that, and then it's, something's going to be greater than. I believe when Jesus was talking about the works being greater, he wasn't talking about the fact that he walked on water, so you're going to walk on water, or even, I don't know, like I say, uh, that, that they're, the things you do are going to be more fantastic. What he was saying was, I believe, was greater in the sense, something that is greater is of greater magnitude, greater size, greater weight, greater volume. Jesus was only here for three years, and he did some pretty fantastic things, but it was not the sign miracles that he did. He didn't say you're going to do greater signs. He said you're going to do greater works. Well, what was his work? He said, I've come to do the, uh, he, said, I, uh, he said, I must work the works of God, works of the Father while I'm here. And he explained that his work was to reveal the Father and, and God's plan to a, to a lost and dying world. That was his work. That was what he worked at. Uh, he didn't have to work at walking on the water. He's God. I mean, that's not a work. Uh, to heal the sick, raise the dead, walk on the water, uh, you know, all the things that he did, that, that was nothing. But his work that the Father sent him to do was to reveal the nature of God to a lost and dying world, to uh, share with them how they could have a relationship with God, that God loved them and that he cared for them. That's the work that he did. That's the work that he did. So uh, when he says greater works than these, uh, you know, he was here three years and, and got to preach to a lot of people and no doubt many were saved. But look at Peter, the very first time Peter preached uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, uh, 3,000 men got saved, I believe it was. Uh, I mean, and then it's, look how it's expanded now. I think Jesus was talking in totality about all those that believe in me who are actively working and doing the work of the Lord. When you do the work of the Lord because you do have faith, in Jesus Christ, the results are going to be greater in magnitude than even I did. Because he understood that him being here only three years and, and being limited, you know, he, God's not limited, but when he came in, in a human body, that limited him some. And the fact that he didn't have that much time. So we'll, we'll amplify that a little bit more. That's number two. And then number three, Jesus said, uh, when and see what I'm trying to do is this you can't leave the context of the believer you can't leave the context of the person doing the works you got to bring that with you 
Okay? A lot of times we don't do that when we're interpreting Scripture. We'll read one verse and, and oh, it says that, and then we'll go to the next verse and, oh, well, it says that, and, but we don't even make the idea that they're connected. Okay? So first he says, believing on me, the believer. That's who can do the work of the Lord. And that person is going to be motivated to actively be working. And when he actively works, he's going to be able to do greater works uh, than even I did. And so then he comes to number three and he says, and this person who is believing, this person, he's a believing, working Christian, believer. And he says, that person, I will be available, although I'm going away. He's done talking, he's going away. He says, I will be available to the believing, working child of God by prayer when that believer calls upon God in my name. You see how this builds on top of one another? He said, what is he doing? If you don't use this to build on top of one another, you get a fragmented idea of what Jesus is saying, but he's not saying in fact, what, what is this all about? It, the context of, of John 14 here hasn't changed. The context is in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. He is dealing with uh, teaching toward, preaching toward, uh, helping them to understand that to not be troubled. Well, why shouldn't the, uh, the person who believes in the Lord, why, should, why shouldn't the person who, uh, uh, or, or let's put it this way, shouldn't the person who up to this point, like them, have, who is believing the Lord, and shouldn't the person who up to this point uh, has been doing work for the Lord, doing the same work, uh, and then he hears that Jesus is going, what? Why wouldn't he be troubled? He said, well, and Jesus is going away. I guess that's it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to do the thing. You know, I guess it's ending. I thought it was going to be longer than this, but wow, it's, it's over. No, Jesus said, no, wait a minute. Even if I go away, and you're a believing, working child of God, I will be available to you. I will be a, available by prayer when that believing, working child of God calls upon me or calls and prays to the Father in my name. Now, we're going to discuss what that means. That's another one of these verses that many times is misinterpreted and misapplied. But I believe the context helps us here. And then finally... He says, when that believing, working, praying child of God uh, continues to do the work of the Lord, what's, what's going to be the result and what should be their desire of a result? Well, he, he, says, he says there that when they do that, the result is going to be that the Father is glorified, verse 13. That's, that's the purpose of all things. That's why God made a rock. That's why God made a tree. That's why God made a hummingbird. You, uh, uh, everything that God created is for his glory. The Bible says the, the heavens declare the glory of God. You ever heard a star preach? I have. Man, I go out there in the middle of the night and look at all those stars twinkling and the vastness of it and the expanse of it. And I wonder, and, and what that star is saying, look, I'm millions of miles away. You couldn't even live long enough to take your fastest rocket ship. You know, if you got on a light beam that travels, what, 170-some thousand miles a second or maybe more than that, and, and lived long, you still couldn't even get That's how vast creation is. He's preaching to me. He's saying this God that created this uh, is a pretty powerful God, big God. You know, and I, I may look at a hummingbird flapping its wings 60 times a second. A second, not a minute, not an hour. If I was a hummingbird, I'd be the laziest hummingbird in town. I'll make it flap my wings 60 times an hour, maybe <laughs> once a minute. But they, that, and, and you know, he's, he's preaching. He's doing that to glorify God. He's saying, look at this. Uh, God can create me to do that. Man, what a powerful God. So everything is created 
for God's glory, even a rock. Jesus himself said when he was going into the triumphal entry, and he said, they said, uh, tell, everybody said, tell them to shut up. They shouldn't be shouting and praising the Lord. Jesus said, if they don't do it, the rocks will. Don't tell me a rock can't shout. Don't tell me a rock can't preach. Yes, sir. So everything is created to bring glory to God. So let's fill in the blanks here a little bit. Not so much in the blanks, but that's kind of the overview that God spoke to my heart about. And uh, so, first of all, we want to look at Jesus gives assurance to the disciples that his work would continue through them and would even increase as they prayed in his name and, and worked for the glory of God. That's kind of my synopsis of this. That's a big fancy word. Uh, almost sounds like he sneezed, synopsis. And, uh, but anyway, that's what that means. Number one, assurance. Jesus, when Jesus gave an assurance of his work continuing even through them, even after he would depart, it, it, should, it would have and did motivate them to say, you know what, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. This, they begin to see the, the fact that this, this, this Jesus thing, this God thing, this salvation thing, this the Father loving mankind and wanting, it was ongoing. It, it, it transcended uh, Jesus' life here on earth. Of course, he's alive in heaven, but uh, it, he wanted to give them assurance uh, and confidence that what they were going to continue to do wasn't wasted out. Sure, everybody would want to know that, you know. Uh, you, you know, in, in, in what they're doing, if they're working the, uh, for the Lord, they want to know that, hey, this means something. I just want, don't want to go through the motions. I'm afraid that sometimes in, in our Christian life and in our churches, we've got to the point where we just go th through the motions, not understanding or, or having it in our mind's eye the fact that this is a continuing part of the plan and purpose of God, and this is a work that Jesus has turned over to us. You know, he said, basically, he said, I'm, I'm done as far as my work here on earth. I'm done as far as, as uh, me coming. You know, he said, it, it's neat that he said, uh, I am the light of the world. Remember when he said that? Then he turned around and said, you're the light of the world. Now, wait a minute. What he was saying was, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But when I go, guess what? You're going to be the light of the world. That'll be his light flowing through us, obviously. But what he was saying was that, uh, you know, through us, God, God uses people. I, I, you know, sometimes we just, don't, we just don't grasp that. We pray and uh, ask God for something. And we stand around and wait for an angel to fly through a window or a lightning bolt to come through the ceiling. But the bottom line is, if God's going to answer a prayer, he's going to answer it with a person. People are answers to prayer. And God uses people to do this. Satan uses people. That's, that's how he gets his work done. If you're going to get work done in this, in this world, you've got to use people. And so Jesus wanted them to have the assurance that the work that they were doing for him, the continuing work, the work that he started, would continue through them so they would not be discouraged and despondent like they were when we find them there in the very first uh, verse of John 14. Don't be troubled. Don't be worried. Don't be discouraged. Don't be depressed. Uh, yeah, I'm going away. This is God's plan. But guess what? You're going to carry on the work. So uh, uh, that gave them assurance and uh, uh, gave them confidence in the fact that they, they still were needed and that they had an opportunity to serve God and they had a great uh, responsibility. Folks, we, as a church of Jesus Christ, we've got a tremendous responsibility. The Lord has turned the work over to us of telling the world about his Father. That's what Jesus did. He said, everything, he said, everything I say, remember we, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, he said, everything I say is coming straight from the Father. He told Philip, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what, G, what was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to let the world know, hey, you can't see him, but he's real. He's there. He loves you. And he sent me to die for you. He sent me so we can have a plan so you could come and live with him throughout all eternity. 
That's the work Jesus did. And that's the work that we must carry on now. The work of Jesus Christ, the work of the ministry, if you want to put it this way, the work of the church is uh, educating people, introducing people to the God who loves them enough to send his son Jesus to die for them so they might have eternal life. That's the work. That's what Jesus did. The work of God through and about Jesus Christ was unending. It will, it will continue on until the very last opportunity for the very last person who would hear the gospel for the very last time in the church age. Now, it will continue uh, during the tribulation period with 144,000 Jews with two great witnesses. Then when you get into the uh, millennium, they'll reinstitute the sacrifices. Jesus will sit on the throne. But still, they'll be, uh, they'll be needing to, in, uh, all those people that are born that thousand year period, they'll have to make a decision for Christ. So it's going to happen there. But I think Jesus is talking specifically here in the church age. Uh, that's, you know, that's as if, a, you know, uh, I'm a church age saint. You're a church age saint if you're alive right now. And, uh, and that's our responsibility uh, to try to reach as many people as we can while we're here. So anyway, he gave them assurance that faith in Christ is not wasted. That prayer to Christ is not wasted. That faith is their faith is their foundation assurance, and as they continue to work for the Lord, that work is a continuing work of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, Jesus gives some assurance. Now let's move on here. I want to look at a couple other things. Go back to our scriptures. He said here in verse 12, <clears throat> he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now remember, verily, verily means, verily means this is really truthful. And then when he said, uh, verily twice, he says, this is really truthful. This is really truthful. Uh, you know, I remember sometimes when I was a kid, a lot of times getting caught doing something. And sometimes I kind of swore two or three times that it was truthful. And it was that's not what this is. It really is true. Jesus is saying this is this is a truth that you really need to pay attention to. So anytime you see him say verily, verily, or of a truth, you need to we need to listen to him all the time, but you really need to, you know, tune the antenna uh, to the word of God here. He says, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. This is where Jesus said, Listen, you're gonna do the word, and this is the kind of word, this is the kind of person I can use. Somebody who, first of all, believes in Jesus. Uh, there's nothing more fundamental, foundational, and basic to the Christian life than faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot, you cannot be a Christian without faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. When you express faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ as the way to salvation, when you express faith in the fact that he is the Son of God, remember he said, he that believeth, uh, uh, he that believeth in me, though you're dead, yet shall he live in me, on me. He used that many, many times. And so you got to believe in Jesus. You got to believe in what He's about, who He is. You got to believe He's the Son of God. Uh, he said in John eight twenty four, "If you do not believe that I am He, you shall die on your sins." Can't be more basic than that. You have to believe in who Jesus is and all that He said about Himself. You know that was the whole issue through the three-year ministry and the three-year... He had three years where he presented himself to, first of all, the nation of Israel, and then, second of all, to the, to the Gentile world. And he said, all right, here I am. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm walking on water. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising the dead. I'm, I'm just changing people's lives. I'm stirring up the whole world. Who do you think that I am? You see... Uh, the whole thing about Jesus is, and what the Word of God reveals about Him, is you have got to make a decision. You know, I, I, I talk to people and say, well, I don't hate Jesus, and I haven't really said bad things about Jesus, and I, uh, different things, but they said, I, but I asked them, I said, but you have you professed Him as Lord and Savior? Have you have made, have you have, have you made a confession? We would uh, Brother and I was talking about this just before we started tonight. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Faith causes you to confess. 
And I talk to people and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a bad person and I haven't, I'm not against God, but I really haven't accepted Jesus uh, as like you were talking about. Well, that's, that, that's the issue. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And so Jesus said, first of all, it has to be a person of faith. It has to be somebody who believes in me, believes who I am. Why would you serve Jesus if you didn't believe who he says he was? I mean, that would be crazy. And, uh, and a lot of people didn't, and a lot don't, because they do not believe that Jesus is God, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Either they do not believe he, he, they believe he didn't exist, and by the way, that would be a hard thing. Man, don't try, try to prove that. All the literature, all the lives have been changed, all the history with, uh, with his very person, uh, you know, just imprinted in it, that, you know, uh, that's, that's all. But then people say, well, even if he did exist, I, I don't really want him to say it. That's the issue right there. Many times people just don't want him. They want to live their own lives, do their own thing. But the problem is that ends up in a very bad way. So Jesus says you've got to believe in him. Then he says, notice he says here in verse, continue on verse 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. We're going to talk about the fact that we'll be continuing the work that Jesus did. And his work was to, uh, to introduce the Father to the world, introduce the great plan of salvation, Introduce the fact that God loved them and, uh, you know, he, he, he wanted to save them. And then he goes on and he says, and we want to deal with this right now because he says, the next step is, and guess what? If he's a believing worker, okay, if you're just sitting on the sidelines, you know, or you're, you're sitting in the, if you're sitting in the, the shallow water, just, just, you know, what do they call it when you just kind of keep yourself up? Treading water. A lot of people do that. Listen, if you're just sitting in your Christian life treading water, you're not a worker. A worker is somebody who's out there, who gets involved, who's active, who's doing the work that the Lord did. It's work. The ministry is work. Telling people about Jesus is work. Uh, and, uh, and, but if you're motivated by faith that you really believe, hey, this guy really is who he says he is. This, Jesus really is the Son of God. It's going to motivate you to be a worker. So if you're a worker, then he says, guess what? Uh, if, if you believe and you're working, he says, he says, you shall do the work that I'm doing. But on top of that, he expands this, expands the vision, the possibilities. He says, greater works than these shall he do because I, I go into my father. Jesus said, I, I'm going away. And part of what he's talking about, he's going to, clarify when we get to verse 15 next week when he talks about the Holy Spirit coming. We couldn't do the things that we do in this supernatural battle, if you will, between good and evil and right and wrong and telling people about Jesus and all that without the help of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. Jesus told the woman at the well that the Lord looked for those. He said that it's a spiritual thing. He that, cometh to God, he, he that comes and worships has to do it in the spirit. And it's a spirit-empowered thing. But, too, he's talking about the fact he wanted everybody to, he wanted them to understand that there are greater works can be done. And I, we've already talked about the fact that I don't believe the Bible teaches that, first of all, the word greater here is simply a mathematical term. And, and he says works, not greater miracles, not greater, greater signs. There's no need for signs. No need for me to do signs. Everything we need to believe and get saved and live a godly Christian life till Jesus comes and be able to cast our, cast our town crowns in his feet is right here in this book. Amen. When John laid his pen down on the Isle of Patmos and he said, don't add to this, don't take away. Why? Because there ain't no need to add take away to it. It's done. The word of God is God's revelation to man. And we need, we've got everything we need to know. And uh, so when he says greater works, then he's, what are you talking about? The magnitude, the influence, the scope. That's a, that's a, you know, scope means how big something is or how, how large a vast, how, how vast uh, 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 an expanse it takes in. Jesus is saying, I, I've come and, 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 you know, did this for three years. 
But, you know, the church is going to do it for a couple of thousand years by now. We're, we're several thousand years down the road from this time. And, man, millions, possibly billions, have been saved. The God, you know, I know the church hasn't done everything it should have. And it fails in a lot of ways. And, you know, by the way, there's a lot of people out there don't mind pointing that out. Thank you. We need, yeah, I mean, you know, we need people to encourage and strengthen and build up and, and help. And you know, there's just always some that feel like, man, God's ordained me to nitpick everything. And, and that's not what we need. And I know the, the church has failed in many ways. And we should do a greater job. But listen, down through the days of the church age, the 2,000 years of church history, man, the church has had a tremendous influence on this world. You can't hardly go anywhere on this planet that you don't see a cross or hear about Jesus or the gospel's been preached there. Has it been done good enough and thorough enough? No, probably not. But man, you, like I say, the, the imprint of Jesus Christ and Christianity and the church of Jesus Christ is all around the world. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, listen, this is just the beginning. I'm going to turn it over to you and, you know, you're 12. Of course, one of them was a devil, but then there's going to be 3,000 saved at Pentecost and then on and on. And then finally, it's going to be such a group. <coughs> Excuse me. In the book of Acts, and that's very early in the church history. Extremely early. He said, uh, he said that there in the book of Acts, and the number of disciples was multiplied. Not, not just the believers, but the disciples. And then it went on and on. When they, usually when they taught in the Word of God or said the Word of God, it was a multitude of men that was uncountable. And that was just in one small area. Now it's, wow, I mean, all over the world. I don't know how many people are really... You say, well, how many people are really true Christians? I don't know. You tell them. You, you seem to know it. I don't. I don't know who all is a Christian, but I know there's many, many, many people, and especially down through the years, have claimed to know Jesus as Savior, going by all, this, all that we see. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about. But we tend to take it, like I say, if you, if you try to apply it to signs and wonders and miracles and walking on water and Greater in that sense. It doesn't say greater signs, doesn't say greater miracles, doesn't say greater fantastic things done, phenomena done. It says greater work. I know that's almost a, a bad word today in our society. Nobody does. <coughs> seems, seems like there's a lot of people doing work. But anyway, let's move on. So he says this. This opportunity is there. This is what's going to happen. I believe, I believe the last part of verse 12 is a prophecy of the growth and effectiveness and, and the uh, scope uh, of Jesus' church. Remember he said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's saying well, that's, that's what he's talking about. Now, let's look at uh, verse 13. So we've got, we've got believing people and you have to believe to work and that motivates you to work and then uh, your work, uh, he says, Jesus is going away, but the work is going to continue through you, and even greater work. And then he says in verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he says in verse 14, If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, once again, we've got to be careful uh, about these verses uh, here especially because we, we, we've got to remember what our context is. Uh, sometimes we take these verses, <coughs> especially promises that God makes, and we make them totally unconditional. Or, uh, you know, say, if you do this, I'll do this, and we'll talk about what Jesus says he'll do, but we don't talk about the conditions. And we certainly got, that's the context of that. But here, I believe when he says, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's, there's some qualifiers here, if you will. What a qualifier is, is, is something uh, that is built into the text 
that reminds us that this is not a carte blanche thing. This isn't a thing that says, well, you, he, in other words, he's not, let's, let's take it from a negative standpoint. He's not saying, uh, if you don't serve me, I'll, I'll, you can ask anything in my name. If you don't believe me, you can ask anything in my name and I'll do it. If you don't work for me, you can ask anything in my name and uh, I'll do it unto you. You see what I'm saying? So to make us understand the context of this promise and what exactly he's talking about, is he saying here, is Jesus saying here that uh, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do? Certainly he's saying that. But what's he been talking about? He's been talking about the believing, the belie first of all, they were believers. If ye, look what it says up back there, let's go back up there. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. First of all, you've got to believe on Jesus to get prayers answered like that. You've got to have faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, so that, that's, a, that's a qualifier. Second of all, I believe he's saying that as you pick up as you pick up my shovel that I'm dropping down, as you pick up my hammer that I'm dropping from my work, remember, Jesus was a carpenter. And I'm not talking about carpenter, but he's, I'm using this as an analogy, kind of painting a picture here. When Jesus says, you shall ask anything in my name here, I believe he's saying, as you're serving me, as you are working, as you are believing in me, you can ask anything whatsoever in my name. By the way, if you'll believe him, if you'll serve him, and you work for him, uh, that'll help you get your prayers lined up straight. You do those things, that'll help you pray the right prayers. Because you're not going to be focused just on simply praying prayers like James said. He said, many times we ask and we receive not because we ask amiss, that we might consume it according to our lusts. Too many times our prayer life is, uh, I wanted this, I wanted that, I wanted this. Bless my heart, if I could tell my mom and dad one thing, I'd say, I regret the ways I bugged you and pestered you. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, they were good, loving parents, but, you know, sometimes my desires for them must sound like, a, uh, you know, just a broken record. And, and that's not what God's talking about here. He's not talking about answered prayers so you can have your, you know, your third pontoon boat. He's not out answering prayers so you can, you know, you can take your night trip to the to the Europe coast or whatever. He's talking about prayers that are focused. And that's what he means when he says in my name. Especially when he's using it in the context of working and serving him. You get involved in serving the Lord. You get involved in working for him. You get involved in picking up his, his shovel and his axe and his hammer to continue to do the work of the Lord, which is telling people about Jesus, uh, introducing them to the Father, uh, helping people see the Father that can't be seen with your testimony. You get involved with that, and I'll guarantee you, you'll understand how much you need prayer. Because it's an uphill battle in this world. We've got a God of this world who hates Jesus, and he's going to fight it all. So what, what I'm talking about is this. When he says in verse 13, now what does he just say? In verse 12 is all the qualifiers. You're a person of faith. You believe on me. And that don't just mean, yeah, I believe Jesus. That means I believe he's my God, my Savior, my Lord. And that, that gives me a, 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 an immediate uh, acceptance and understanding of his lordship in my life. And then he says, I'm a worker. I'm working for you, Lord. I'm willing to pick up your hammer, willing to pick up uh, your saw and, and your shovel and do the work that you did. And, you know, and, and, I, and then they've got to have, they've got to have this vision of saying, well, there's, you know, we've got a great work to do. We've got a great work to do. Folks, this world is upside down, sideways, and inside. So messed up, it's hard to comprehend. That tells us there's a great work to do. Not necessarily social things, although them certainly are part of it. But what men need most right now is to know that there is a God who loves them. 
who is a God who sent his son to die for their sins and who is a God who will hold them accountable for how they spent their life and whether they came to know him. That's the three things this world needs to know. And that's our word. That's the seeds we're to plant. So he says here, and in and, and, and the light of that, in that context, in that state of mind, understanding, he says, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. So Jesus is saying, uh, you're working, you're going to be doing this work, and I'm going to be available to you to help you, and, and, he, and whatsoever means what it means. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to give you everything you want. And remember, this is, this is the context of working for him. He said, well, I thought G Jesus said on other occasions that, uh, you know, ask in my name and pray in my name. He did. You've got to remember, when you say that in the name of Jesus, that's not just some, uh, some little old cliche or bumper sticker you're sticking on the end of your prayer. That means you are qualifying your prayer. You are saying, I am praying in the name of Jesus because I want it to be authenticated by him I want it to be identified uh, to him, and I want it, I want this prayer to line up with his will. Praying in his will and praying in his name, same thing. You know, it, 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 let's let's say pray, let's say say Jesus said they, they would send emissaries to other kingdoms, and uh, you know, using emissary was just a messenger, you know, and they'd send this messenger. He'd go before a king. And these kings tend to be pretty. Picky, you know, and, and uh, you came and, uh, you know, just messing around. They, wasn't, they didn't have time for you. But if you went in there and say, you know what, king, maybe they went to the king of Zion or somewhere. And this king from another has sent this emissary. Well, this emissary ain't nothing. He has no power. He, he's not a king. But he goes in there, I come to you in the name of my king. Well, that other king is going to set up and take notice. Oh, this is something that that other king has authorized. This is something that another king, this is going to be his will and what he said. This other king uh, has sent me a message through this man, and when he says it's in the name of that king, it validates it. It gives it a stamp of approval. Oh, I'll listen to you now. You see, that's what praying in the name of Jesus is all about. It's not a magic it's not a magic uh, little cliche or a magic little phrase that you tie on the end of your prayer to guarantee that God's going to do what you want him to do. He's going to do whatsoever if that prayer is lined up with the will of God. He's going to do whatsoever if that, if that prayer is validated by the name of Jesus. In other words, Jesus looks at it and says, yeah, here's my prayer. And he, he finally gets that and says, now, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the Father, and here's my, here's my signature on that. It's about the prayer, about what the purpose of the prayer is all about, how it fits into the plan of God. The majority of prayers we pray, and I'm making this as a categorizing statement, I can't tell you how many or how often. I, let me put it to you this way. Unfortunately, the majority of prayers that I pray probably don't have Jesus' approval. Now, that don't mean he won't hear them. That don't mean he necessarily won't answer them. But he is promising here, if this prayer is about believing in me, if this prayer is about continuing the work, if this prayer is about expanding the work, if this prayer is about finally, if you look down there in the last part of verse 12, the last qualifier is, he says, that these things shall, greater works shall, shall ye do. And then the last qualifier is, is in the last part of verse 13, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If that prayer has in its purpose and in its uh, goal, if you will, to bring glory to the Father, that's another qualifying there. Jesus will sign off on that because that's what he lived for. That's what he done. 
He wanted to bring glory to the Father. That's what his life was all about. That was his purpose. That's our purpose. And our prayers, if they are going to be prayers that Jesus can sign off on, they need to be about things that bring glory to the Father. Too many times there are things about what will make me happy, what will satisfy or appease my desire for something. This Jesus said the work's going to continue. And the work's going to continue through you. No greater, no greater honor than working for the Lord. Wow. I remember many years ago, uh, a friend of mine that, uh, that, uh, that was involved in racing, whatever you feel about him now, but told me that there was an opportunity uh, for someone uh, to work for Richard Penny. Man, I got on, I, we didn't have internet then, you know, if we did, I didn't know anything about it. Man, I got on the phone, started calling people, people that I knew were involved in racing. I said, man, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be the greatest thing in the world as far as somebody that like racing, auto racing, especially in the South, to work for King Richard Petty, the king. Now, obviously, I didn't get the job. You know, it's like when I ran for president. You say, I didn't, I didn't know you ran for president. Well, that's because I didn't win. You didn't know. But now I work for the king of kings. The number one king. Yeah. The king of all glory. The king of creation. That's what every believer does. And my purpose here, when I get up in the morning and you get up in the morning as a child of God, our purpose, when we take that first breath, we ought to say, Lord, thank you for this breath of air. May I use it to bring glory to you. That's the work that Jesus was talking about. When we do the work and let people know who God is and what he can do and how much he loves them, that glorifies God and honor. That's why we shouldn't be troubled. That's why he's saying, disciples, you, you Christians living down there in the COVID-19 period of time, don't give up, don't quit. We're doing a great work. And it's a great work for the great King. Thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Uh, pray for this Sunday service. We will be having drive-in services. When you get here, we'll make everything aware to you about all the things that you need to do. But we will. You can come in your car. You can bring an outdoor chair and sit on the parking lot. Uh, we're going to have a full-blown worship service. But like I say, we won't be in the building for the next couple of Sundays. And then we're going to reevaluate where we are with this situation we're going through as i said before we have two we have two criteria about this reopening uh we want to do church we want to have church absolutely yes but we want to make everybody comfortable in our reopening god bless you thank you pray for one another and we ask you ask that we ask, we ask you to pray for those that are sick around us that god touch and heal them thank you so much god bless you